It has action, romance, horror, sci-fi, and stars some well-known actual actors. What's not to love about Plan 9 from Outer Space? A film that makes you wonder, what the hell am I watching? Coming up next on the Soapy Loves Movies channel. Cult Films. What are they? A cult film is a film that has amassed a passionate fan base despite being niche. The term is often used to describe films that are so bad it's good, or didn't initially gain the traction that they did in later years. Some examples of cult films that I've discussed before are Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and Highlander, both being films that were never considered horrible but gained much more of a dedicated fan base in the years following their releases. One of the most famous cult films of all time is Plan 9 from Outer Space. It's all over the Wikipedia page for the topic. The film's creator, Ed Wood, has many cult films under his belt as he spent a lot of his career making low-budget sci-fi films. He even had a biopic made about him in 1994 by Tim Burton. Now, I have seen Plan 9 from Outer Space before, and I only decided to watch it originally because it stars both Vampyra and Bella Lugosi. I'll get to that later. Anyways, let's get into the movie. Without further ado, on with the review. The film opens with a narration from Jaron Criswell King, a psychic from the 50s, who gained infamy for his predictions that were way off. This intro is essentially just him giving some vague recountal about the movie, and it's presented like the opening to the real Chris Wells show at the time, Chris Well Predicts. And remember my friend, future events such as these will affect you in the future. How did Edward meet this guy? Anyways, we get very overdramatic opening credits with spooky music. And as I said, the aforementioned Vampyra and Bella Lugosi do have roles in this film. We see Lugosi here playing an old man at the funeral of his deceased wife. This is probably the best acted scene in the film, so we should enjoy it while it lasts. Just at sundown, a small group gathered in silent prayer around the newly opened grave of the beloved wife of an elderly man. I know that this is being narrated over, so we as an audience wouldn't hear the dialogue, but there clearly isn't a sermon being given. The guy's lips aren't moving. Don't close the book, you clearly weren't reading it. Two pilots named Jeff and Danny get caught in a disturbance and spot a... flying saucer. Yeah, alright, Mr. Wood. The cockpit looks like a made-up set piece, but I will say that the shots of the plane look decent, although it could be stock footage. The flying saucer lands by a graveyard in an absolutely thrilling effect, and the noise scares a couple of gravediggers. The lip syncing here is pretty naff too. Did you hear anything? I thought I did. Don't like hearing noises, especially when there ain't supposed to be any. Vampyra, later suggested to be the ghost of the dead wife, then appears and it's implied that she kills them in a fadeaway cut. <coughs> Again, thrilling stuff. The old man leaves his home and is suggested to be hit by a car via a really questionable editing choice. The old man left that home, never to return again. The scream used here sounds very similar to the scream in the previous scene, which makes me wonder if it's the stock sound again or if he reused that screen clip. There's actually a reason for this that I'll get into later. At the old man's funeral, two of the attendees find these mannequins, I mean, the bodies of the gravediggers, and the police show up to investigate. Jeff is then seen at home with his wife, Paula, and he explains that he saw a flying saucer at work. It was shaped like a huge cigar. Dan and Edith saw it too. And when it passed over, the whole compartment lighted up with a blinding glare. No, it wasn't. It was shaped like your stereotypical UFO. What kind of cigars were they smoking back in the 50s? 
Jeff elaborates that the government has sworn him to secrecy, before being knocked to the ground by the UFO. It lands in the cemetery once more, and a detective called Clay goes nearer to take a closer look. Unbeknownst to him, however, the old man steps out of this crypt. I know he's covering his face vampire style, and the film quality isn't exactly 4K, but this is clearly not Lugosi anymore. Vampira shows up again and she and not Lugosi kill Clay off screen, with his other detective buddies not too far away. That's kinda messed up. But this does give us a very famous and hilarious line from this movie. Your guess is good as mine, Larry. One thing's sure, Inspector Clay's dead, murdered, and somebody's responsible. You all saw the flying saucer, how do you know that it's a somebody and not a something? B-movie detectives, man, thinking that they know everything... never mind. Vampira watches Clay's funeral procession from afar, and more flying saucers show up in Hollywood during the coming days. You're joking me. What is that? So, the military show up via very obvious stock footage and try to shoot down the UFOs, seemingly scaring them away. Fuck this shit, I'm out. This guy, Colonel Edwards, then further explains the recent alien activity. For a time, we tried to contact them by radio, but no response. Then they attacked a town. A small town, I'll admit but nevertheless a town of people. We then see the aliens for themselves. They're the typical mid-20th century low-budget sci-fi aliens, aka a couple of clearly human twats wearing shiny suits and talking in funny voices. At least stuff like the Twilight Zone in the original series had some makeup to help a viewer's suspension of disbelief. The aliens return to one of their motherships and explain to their ruler, and therefore us, that they've tried to contact our governments to no success. So now we're acting on a Plan 9, which involves resurrecting the dead. I mean, at least we have a reason for that old couple coming back to life and the title of the film has been dropped. What plan will you follow now? Plan 9. It's been absolutely impossible to work through these Earth creatures. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! One of the sources returns to Earth and the old man breaks into Paula and Jeff's house that night. In a scene reminiscent of Todd Browning's Dracula, he enters Paula's room to attack her and she escapes, now being pursued by Not Lugosi, Vampira, and the now reanimated Clay. The resurrection scene is actually shot decently and reminds me of similar scenes in later films, although you can see that the actor is struggling to manoeuvre himself. Need a hand there, mate? Paula manages to make her way to a roadside where one of the guys from earlier picks her up. We then cut to the Pentagon of all places, where Colonel Edwards is told by his superior that the government have developed a computer that translates any language into English. Very convenient for the plot. He shows Colonel Edwards a message from the aliens where the aliens just roast us, basically. With your ancient, juvenile minds, you have developed explosives too fast for your minds to conceive what you are doing. You are on the verge of destroying the entire universe. Humans are the most dangerous being in the universe is an idea that was used over and over again both before and after this film came out, to the point where it's been the subject of parody. I have combined the DNA of the world's most evil animals to make the most evil creature of them all. It turns out it's man. It's then shown that the aliens don't quite have control over the resurrected corpses. They control them using electrode guns, but these things can get jammed and lead to mishaps like this. Grab him, you fool! Drop the gun to the floor, Tanner. The metal will break contact. Thanks to this display, the alien leader devises a plan to force humanity to accept their existence, essentially creating a microcosmic zombie apocalypse. Just as planned, Not Lugosi enters Jeff and Paula's house as they are being interviewed by the police, and he is hit by a ray gun, reducing him to a spooky, scary skeleton. Jeff, 
Lieutenant Harper from earlier, and Colonel Edwards leave to inspect the cemetery and leave Paula with the police officer. Which wasn't the smartest idea as Paula gets kidnapped by Clay, or what used to be Clay. On the other hand, Jeff et al get invited into the spaceship, which leads to a confrontation between them and the aliens. They would be of no use to you now. They've been mighty useful before on Flesh and Blood, and you two look like you've got a lot of both. You don't say they look just like you. The aliens reiterate what was said in that message earlier, and that humans will eventually discover something called Solaronite, causing a chain reaction leading to the destruction of the universe due to humanity's hubris. Lieutenant Harper then tries to arrest the aliens, which is like, are you okay? This is quickly interrupted when the plot focuses back on Paula's kidnapping. The aliens' ray has been turned off, allowing the police to knock Clay out and rescue Paula, but a fight breaks out in the ship when our villains go to turn it back on. The fight looks very fake, the punches don't land or anything, but it looks pretty unchoreographed, adding some sense of realism to it. The ship begins to catch fire for some unclear reason, and the humans escape, leaving the flaming ship to soar back into the air before it explodes into nothing. Chriswell returns to give us a closing monologue, and one of the lines made me burst out laughing. Perhaps on your way home, someone will pass you in the dark, and you will never know it, for they will be from outer space. Yeah, okay, mate. Forget passing by 30 murderers in your lifetime, apparently you're gonna pass by at least one alien as well. I mean, where to really begin with this movie? There's so much you can say about it. First of all, I was kinda skeptical about the alien ghoul storyline to begin with. This is one of those movies where more and more gets explained as you keep watching. I think it is one of the more imaginative parts of this movie, Especially as the ghouls bring zombies to mind, a horror trope that hadn't really been well established at this point. Vampira does kind of move like an unarticulated Barbie doll though, I'm not too sure about the direction there. The effects are… well, you saw them. This movie is very low budget and is full of editing mistakes, as well as acting that can be easily replicated by wet cardboard. From what I've seen of him, pretty much all of Edward's movies are like this, hence his infamy and cult status. I am reviewing a colourised version of the film, so this may be due to that, but some of the shots look very very dark, and then we'll cut to a much brighter shot, yet we're supposed to be in the same scene. It's pretty jarring visually. Now, Bella Lugosi died in 1956 meaning that this film was actually released posthumously, and it's actually the last film he starred in. This is also seemingly why there is an actor that's clearly not him playing his role in a lot of the scenes. According to this article by Horror Observe, Ed Wood only had 15 minutes of footage of Bella Lugosi to use for the film, so he hired his wife's chiropractor to replace him. This is also probably why the fake Lugosi always walks around with his cape covering his face. Like, come on, he could be more subtle about it. Despite all this, I do recommend this movie. It's one of the pillars of So Bad It's Good media. If you like Manos, The Room, I Am Here Now, this is a movie for you. Well, that's all for this video. Be sure to follow me on social media as they are all linked in my description box. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and as always, thanks for watching. The blue and green ones are my favorite kind, but I'll eat the colored ones from time to time. Cause Polos is life, 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 Polos is life. Sleep on.